It's up there. It's up there? It is. We might have to get a shot of that then. It's on the top of the shelf up there. Left hand side. That's, that was your first computer? That's the first computer I built, yes. Was that in kit form or did you...? Uh... No, no, it's entirely home designed, including anodizing the aluminium in the kitchen sink and things like that. It's a... <laughs> My introduction to computing was through my work in the engineering department at Cambridge. Um, I was fascinated by aeroplanes and aerodynamics and uh, I moved from my first degree in maths to a PhD in rather theoretical aerodynamics um, and in the course of that PhD I was using some machines um, to control experiments and such like so I wasn't entirely theoretical. Um, but at, at that time also um, a bunch of enthusiasts formed the Cambridge University Processor Group. I wasn't a founder, but I did go to the first meeting and, and got to know the founders and thought, well, this, this is interesting. Um, I, I'm interested in pursuing my, my love of flying by building a flight simulator. So how do I go about doing that? In the late 1970s, which is when I started tinkering with computers. Flight simulators were very large, expensive, professional machines at the time. And so I didn't really have a clear path from starting to build a microprocessor to, to building my own flight simulator. Um, that was a big stretch. But it was clear that if I, if I was going to pursue this, that, that this was the right place to start. And, and uh, I started at the beginning um, buying a, a microprocessor and some other chips and assembling a very simple computer. Um, and, and, and gradually my, I, I, I forgot about the flight simulator bit and, and got more interested in the computing bit. Of course the, the flight simulator interest came full circle when, uh, when I discovered Aviator on the BBC Micro several years later. I mean that was a, a spectacular flight simulator considering the uh, capabilities of the resources it, it had on the BBC Micro. Um, so that, that, that kind of completed the circle for me but in the meantime I'd taken the tangent into computing and stayed permanently on it. Hobbyist computer clubs were definitely becoming popular in the West Coast in California and just a beginning to start in the UK um, but we were following behind the Americans at that point um, but it was very much the similar theme. Um, uh, probably being a student group uh, it was a similar theme with far uh, smaller resources. Um, but uh, yes, he was just enthusiasts, building stuff, comparing notes. It was, it was really the point in history where it became possible for somebody sitting at home with a little bit of money and a soldering iron um, to assemble a computer that was um, pretty basic but still useful and entertaining. And um, the machines I was using in my PhD were things like the computer automation LSI-4, and they were not enormously more powerful than the sort of things you could build for you know a hundred pounds at home. People uh, picked up the, the techniques for building computers uh, from clubs talking to other people who were ahead of them but also I think pretty much from magazines. There were a number of magazines around at the time with titles such as Wireless World which is a long-standing one. Electronics Today International I remember was one of my favorites. Practical Electronics maybe that was American I'm not quite sure. But these magazines not only had articles on how you could go about building stuff, but of course they also had adverts um, from uh, the shops that would sell you stuff. Um, I remember being very nervous uh, buying the parts for my first machine. I bought the parts for mail order from California, and that meant using a credit card over the telephone internationally, and as a student I'd never done that before. Well, it worked out fine. The, the chips arrived, you know, they took two or three weeks to arrived through the post, but that's how we found the components. The chips were made by uh, the big names of the time, Texas Instruments, um, Motorola was around then. Uh, the microprocessor I used was designed and manufactured by Signetics, um, who I think even then were owned by Philips. We picked up ideas from the meetings of the processor group, but then basically we, we went off and, and, and uh, bought bits and, and, and uh, tried to assemble them. The, the processor group also had meetings in uh, each other's houses. And I remember um, uh, a group of people meeting in, in my house in Cambridge, which was 7 St John's Road at the time. And, uh, and somebody called Roger Wilson that I got to know a little bit through the processor group poking around in my machine and finding a bug um, in the memory. Um, that was the first time 
Roger found a bug in my hardware. It was definitely not the last time. <clears throat> At the time we started building machines, memory chips were available. So uh, they, they were very small. I think uh, my first machine used one kilobit to static RAMs, so a thousand bits of memory on a chip. Um, but the whole machine was integrated circuits, so we, we were not um, dealing very much with, tra with transistors at all. I, I remember I did have to deal with transistors uh, because I built um, a card for programming EEPROMs. Uh, and EEPROMs required at that time minus 5, plus 5 and plus 12 volts and you had to switch a programming pin at quite a high voltage. So that particular circuit board has quite a few discrete transistors on. But I wasn't an electronics engineer. I didn't get on very well with transistors. Um, I preferred the, the chips. Um, even in the analog domain, I, uh, my introduction to electronics was, was in the analog domain using 741 op amps. To build sound systems, I built eight track sound mixers and so on. I could understand chips. I, I did a lot of my own soldering, yes, and, and the computer stuff was all built with VeroWire, which was a, a fairly standard technology at the time. It involved soldering, but you had a wiring pen and a standard printed circuit board that was a generic, and you put the sockets in, and then with this wiring pin, you would basically wrap it round one of the socket legs, take it round a few combs, and then wrap it round the other end. This was very fine wire with, I think, a, some kind of polyurethane insulation, I think, and when you soldered it, the insulation melted. But where the wire was not soldered, it was insulated, so you could run lots of wires down these combs and they wouldn't short circuit. Um, I learned some time later that the, f the, the um, fumes given off by soldering this wire were not very pleasant, but... Uh, uh, you didn't learn at the time. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was not advertised at the time. No, I'm sure. What I recall and this is a long time ago, and my, I'm not known for my memory. Um, if you talk to, to Sophie Wilson, her memory of this era is much better than mine. Um, but I seem to recall, um, I was in my office at the engineering department and, and the phone rang. Um, there was no email then. Um, and it was Herman, and, and, and uh, Herman said he'd like to come and talk to me. Um, and he, I think he came to my office in the engineering department, uh, sat down there and said that he and Chris Curry were thinking of starting a company and they were looking for a few people to help them on the technical side. The, they'd obviously looked at the processor group because that was the area they were looking at. Was I interested? Uh, and I'm fairly sure my reply was along the lines of, well, this is a fairly recently acquired hobby as far as I'm concerned. I can't claim any expertise, but you know, if you think I can help, then, then, uh, then I'm happy to have a go. Um, uh, and uh, th that's where it started. The next meeting I remember was a meeting with Herman, Chris and Chris Turner at the Fort St George on Midsummer Common in Cambridge. And we sat in this pub, the four of us, and th the plans were firming up a bit. I don't remember if at that time they'd begun to uh, talk about the fruit machine contract, which was the first uh, piece of development contractual work they got. The fruit machine contract was about converting fruit machines from electromechanical, which is how they all worked up to that point, to uh, microprocessor controlled, which was the way it was all going and has stayed ever since. So we were taking a, a fruit machine, which is a one arm bandit, you know, a thing you never put money into, but I'm very averse to all forms of gambling um, and <clears throat> I understand why the state has to license and tax it um, I still don't understand why they sponsor it through national lotteries I think this is a very bad idea but that's just <clears throat> my principles um, which slightly clash with working on the fruit machine project I wasn't entirely comfortable but um, it was a technical challenge and that seemed to override my principles at the time um, Yes, so we basically took the old electromechanical controller out and then uh, replaced it with a formidably complicated microprocessor control system which involved two national semiconductor SCMP microprocessors running in parallel. Getting that to work and passing some of the robustness tests was quite instructive. So as soon as we said we had a working system, um, the first thing they wanted us to do was um, 
plug it into a main socket with one of those block adapters, plug a small arc welding kit into the other socket, and then weld metal while using the fruit machine to see how... This, this was what passed as EMC testing in those days, I think. And the other problem they knew about was that um, there were some electronic fruit machines already out on the market, and users had discovered that they were very prone to paying out if you used an electronic cigarette lighter close to the uh, cash socket. The electronic cigarette lighters were just a great source of interference. It just injects a jolt, and if you did this enough times, it would throw cash at you. Um, so um, one thing that, 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 that Roger did um, very early on was built uh, an FM radio receiver which detected anybody trying to do this and immediately made sure whatever the machine did, it didn't pay out. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it shut down and, and, and reset and started again at any sign of this. I was um, mostly involved in developing the software for this parallel system. Um, Chris Turner did most of the hardware, as I recall, and, and Roger developed this FM detector for electronic cigarette lighters. Um, I should say that I was, my, my day job was still in the university. I was um, a PhD student and then research fellow um, through till 1981. I only joined the staff in October 81. Um, so I don't really know what happened to the, to the fruit machine business once we um, got something working. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it led to a, a longer contract. What I do recall is that uh, concurrent with that, um, Chris was uh, setting up Science of Cambridge with Clive Sinclair and um, they decided to try and sell this MK14, a, a sort of small microprocessor PCB with a hexadecimal keypad and seven segment display. And I know they got the first circuit for this and I verified a prototype of that in my front room, um, discovered that in copying the mass programmed ROM into the two fusible link ROMs that were on the MK14, they managed to copy it wrong. Um, so I did a little bit of debugging of that. So I, I had a, an early hand in the MK14 work. Um, but Roger looked at the MK14 and, and did the classic thing of saying, uh, I can do better than that. Um, and, and he went home at Easter, came back after Easter with a design for a machine with, again, a hexadecimal keypad and a seven segment display, this time based on a 6502. The MK14 used the SCMP that we'd used in the fruit machine. The 6502 is a nicer processor to program. Uh, the SCMP had a number of curious features. Um, and and the, the circuit was simpler. Um, it, it was generally more elegant and more powerful. The, the uses you could put this to were, were pretty basic. I mean, you could, in a lab, use it to control um, you could write software that would wiggle the I.O. pins to control something. Um, you could write little programs to um, do simple computations on the display and so on. If you believe the BBC... Slave, initiate the backup system. Oh, I'm very sorry about this, but that was the backup system. With Blake 7, you can control a 22nd century interstellar spaceship with an Acorn System 1. So it was really an instrument for learning about microprocessors. It found quite a lot of interest in hobbyists, and I think some university departments also used it for teaching students. Um, the sales, uh, I don't know the sales numbers, but I'm guessing that, that they were in the thousands, um, maybe 10, 20,000, I'm not sure. They required people who were prepared to do quite a lot of work to get into them and to use them to do things. And I think we even, they, were, they were sold as kits. So um, they were restricted to the market of people who knew which end to pick up a soldering iron. Did, did they ever cross into your day job? Did you, would you ever take one into the lab? Because obviously you, you've mentioned that you were working on things like aerodynamics and, and, and what have you. Were there things you could potentially use it for in your day job? Or did, you keep the, did your two wheels, were they separate? I never used um, a System 1 in my day job. Um, but the, the System 1 was built on two Euro cards, and ver very soon after that was released, um, CPU Limited, under the marketing name Acorn, um, built larger systems which were based on card frames. And, and these cards were plugged into a rack, and then you could put a video 
card in there. You could put an interface to the conventional keyboard. You could basically grow it up to something bigger. Now, I didn't use that directly. My relationship with, with the embryonic acorn was that I was building little cards myself, prototyping them, and then giving the design to acorn, who then commercialized them. In particular, I designed an A to D converter. So I had a very similar system at home based in a card frame, which I built myself. And I did use that in my work. Up to those days, most people who wrote a PhD thesis would write it by hand on paper and give it to a secretary to type up, who would laboriously type it onto sheets of paper. Um, but computers were just arriving. So um, I wanted to write my PhD thesis. I got to that point. Uh, so the first thing I did was I wrote a text editor for my machine at home, um, which I'd built myself, and then I wrote my thesis on that. And then I devised a way of, of conveying it across through a parallel cable to one of these computer automation LSI-4s. And then we could take the information to an LSI-4 with a daisy wheel printer attached. And because my thesis has some mathematics in it, um, I needed a big... A twin wheel daisy wheel. It had a, a Roman wheel and a Greek wheel. Um, and my thesis was printed on about 200 feet of continuous paper. <laughs> so it came out like a very large toilet roll. Um, and then you uh, had to snip it up. <laughs> I then had to guillotine it up into relevant size units and, 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 and bind it, yes. Um, I also used um, the machine I built at home, in, in, I think for gathering some experimental data. Um, but its first use was for writing the thesis. My text editor, which was cobbled together very quickly and, and was full of death traps, so it had, a, it had a change buffer, and if you overran the change buffer by one character, it just crashed and lost everything. Lost everything. Um, that was uh, tidied up a bit, by which I mean extensively rewritten, and became Acorn's edit program. But as I say, the, there was far more work that went into transforming what I had written into the product than I'd put into the first prototype. The 16-bit microprocessors could not use the bandwidth that was available in the memory that people put in these machines. So you'd spent your money, you bought some bandwidth, and then you were coupling this to a processor that couldn't use that basic resource. And this just struck us as wrong. 